My Impossible People Seneca, or the Toreador of Virtue Rousseau, or the Return to Nature in Impuris Naturalibus Schiller, or the Moral Trumpeter of Sickingen Dante, or the Hyena that Writes Poetry in Tombs Kant, or Kant as an illegible character. Victor Hugo, or the lighthouse on the sea of nonsense. List, or the school of racing after women. Georges Sand, or Lactia Ubertas in plain English. The cow with plenty of beautiful milk. Michelet, or Enthusiasm in its shirt-sleeves. Carlyle, or Pessimism after undigested meals. John Stuart Mill, or Offensive Lucidity. The Brothers Goncourt, or The Two Ajaxes, fighting with Homer. Music by Offenbach. Zola, or The Love of Stinking. 2. Renan, Theology, or The Corruption of Reason by Original Sin, paren, Christianity, and paren. Proof of this. Renan, who, even in those rare cases where he ventures to say either yes or no on a general question, invariably misses the point with painful regularity. For instance, he would fain associate science and nobility, but surely it must be obvious that science is democratic. He seems to be actuated by a strong desire to represent an aristocracy of intellect. But, at the same time, he grovels on his knees, and not only on his knees, before the opposite doctrine, the gospel of the humble. What is the good of all free-spiritedness, modernity, mockery, and acrobatic suppleness, if in one's belly one is still a Christian, a Catholic, and even a priest? Renan's forte, precisely like that of a Jesuit and father confessor, lies in his seductiveness. His intellectuality is not devoid of that unctuous complacency of a parson. Like all priests, he becomes dangerous only when he loves. He is second to none in the art of skillfully worshipping a dangerous thing, this intellect of Renan's, which in its action is enervating, is one calamity the more for poor sick France, with her willpower all going to pieces. 3. Sans bouve. There is naught of man in him. He is full of petty spite towards all virile spirits. He wanders erratically. He is subtle, inquisitive, a little bored, forever with his ear to keyholes. At bottom, a woman, with all woman's revengefulness and sensuality. As a psychologist, he is a genius of slander, inexhaustively rich in means to this end. No one understands better than he how to introduce a little poison into praise. In his fundamental instincts he is plebeian, and next of kin to Rousseau's resentful spirit. Consequently, he is a romanticist, for beneath all romanticism Rousseau's instinct for revenge grunts and frets. He is a revolutionary, but kept within bounds by funk. He is embarrassed in the face of everything that is strong, public opinion, the academy, the court even Port Royal. He is embittered against everything great in men 
and things, against everything that believes in itself, enough of a poet and of a female to be able to feel greatness as power. He is always turning and twisting because, like the proverbial worm, he constantly feels that he is being trodden upon. As a critic, he has no standard of judgment, no guiding principle, no backbone. Although he possesses the tongue of the cosmopolitan libertine which can chatter about a thousand things, he has not the courage even to acknowledge his libertinage. As a historian, he has no philosophy and lacks the power of philosophical vision. Hence his refusal to act the part of a judge, and his adoption of the mask of objectivity in all important matters. His attitude is better in regard to all those things in which subtle and effete taste is the highest tribunal. In these things he really does have the courage of his own personality. He really does enjoy his own nature. He actually is a master. In some respects he is a prototype of Baudelaire. 4. The Imitation of Christ is one of those books which I cannot even take hold of without physical loathing. It exhales a perfume of the eternally feminine, which to appreciate fully one must be a Frenchman or a Wagnerite. This saint has a way of speaking about love which makes even Parisiennes feel a little curious. I am told that that most intelligent of Jesuits, Auguste Comte, who wished to lead his compatriots back to Rome by the circuitous route of science, drew his inspiration from this book. And I believe it. Quote, the religion of the heart. Unquote. Five. George Eliot. They are rid of the Christian God, and therefore think it all the more incumbent upon them to hold tight to Christian morality. This is an English way of reasoning, but let us not take it ill in moral females, a la Eliot. In England, Every man who indulges in any trifling emancipation from theology must retrieve his honor in the most terrifying manner by becoming a moral fanatic. That is how they do penance in that country. As for us, we act differently. When we renounce the Christian faith, we abandon all right to Christian morality. This is not by any means self-evident and in defiance of English shallow pates the point must be made ever more and more plain. Christianity is a system, a complete outlook upon the world, conceived as a whole. If its leading concept, the belief in God, is wrenched from it, the whole is destroyed. Nothing vital remains in our grasp. Christianity presupposes that man does not and cannot know what is good or bad for him. The Christian believes in God, who alone can know these things. Christian morality is a command. Its origin is transcendental. It is beyond all criticism, all right to criticism. It is true only on condition that God is truth. It stands or falls with the belief in God. If the English really believe that they know intuitively and of their own accord what is good and evil, if, therefore, they assert that they no longer need Christianity as a guarantee of morality, this in itself is simply the outcome of the dominion of Christian valuations, and a proof of the strength and profundity of this dominion. It only shows that the origin of English morality has been forgotten, and that its exceedingly relative right to exist is no longer felt. For Englishmen, morality is not yet a problem. 6. Georges Sand I have been reading the first 
l'être d'un voyageur. Like everything that springs from Rousseau's influence, it is false, made up, blown out, and exaggerated. I cannot endure this bright wallpaper style any more than I can bear the vulgar strivings after generous feelings. The worst feature about it is certainly the coquettish adoption of male attributes by this female, after the manner of ill-bred schoolboys. And how cold she must have been inwardly all the while, this insufferable artist! She wound herself up like a clock, and wrote, as cold as Hugo and Balzac, as cold as all romanticists are as soon as they begin to write. And how self-complacently she must have lain there, this prolific ink-yielding cow! For she had something German in her, German in the bad sense, just as Rousseau, her master, had. Something which could only have been possible when French taste was declining. And Renan adores her. 7. A moral for psychologists. Do not go in for any notebook psychology. Never observe for the sake of observing. Such things lead to a false point of view, to a squint, to something forced and exaggerated. To experience things on purpose, this is not a bit of good. In the midst of an experience, a man should not turn his eyes upon himself. In such cases, any eye becomes the evil eye. A born psychologist instinctively avoids seeing for the sake of seeing, and the same holds good of the born painter. Such a man never works from nature. He leaves it to his instinct, to his camera obscura, to sift, and to define the, quote, fact, unquote, quote, nature, unquote, the, quote, experience, unquote. The general idea, the conclusion, the result, is the only thing that reaches his consciousness. He knows nothing of that willful process of deducing from particular cases, what is the result when a man sets about this matter differently, when, for instance, after the manner of Parisian novelists, he goes in for notebook psychology on a large and small scale? Such a man is constantly spying on reality, and every evening he bears home a handful of fresh curios. But look at the result, a mass of daubs, at best a piece of mosaic, in any case, something heaped together, restless and garish. The Goncourt are the greatest sinners in this respect. They cannot put three sentences together which are not absolutely painful to the eye, the eye of the psychologist. From an artistic standpoint, nature is no model. It exaggerates, distorts, and leaves gaps. Nature is the accident. To study from nature seems to me a bad sign. It betrays submission, weakness, fatalism. This lying in the dust before trivial facts is unworthy of a thorough artist. To see what is, is the function of another order of intellects. The anti-artistic, the matter of fact. One must know who one is. 8. Concerning the Psychology of the Artist For art to be possible at all, that is to say, in order that an aesthetic mode of action and of observation may exist, a certain preliminary physiological state is indispensable. Ecstasy. Translator's footnote. The German word Rausch, as used by Nietzsche here, suggests a blend of our two English words, intoxication and elation. End translator's note. 
this state of ecstasy must first have intensified the susceptibility of the whole machine. Otherwise, no art is possible. All kinds of ecstasy, however differently produced, have this power to create art, and above all the state dependent upon sexual excitement, this most venerable and primitive form of ecstasy. The same applies to that ecstasy which is the outcome of all great desires, all strong passions. The ecstasy of the feast, of the arena, of the act of bravery, of victory, of all extreme action, the ecstasy of cruelty, the ecstasy of destruction, the ecstasy following upon certain meteorological influences, as, for instance, that of springtime, or upon the use of narcotics, and finally the ecstasy of will, that ecstasy which results from accumulated and surging willpower. The essential feature of ecstasy is the feeling of increased strength and abundance. Actuated by this feeling, a man gives of himself to things he forces them to partake of his riches, he does violence to them. This proceeding is called idealizing. Let us rid ourselves of a prejudice here. Idealizing does not consist, as is generally believed, in a suppression or an elimination of detail, or of unessential features. A stupendous accentuation of the principal characteristics is by far the most decisive factor at work, and in consequence the minor characteristics vanish. 9. In this state a man enriches everything from out his own abundance. What he sees, what he wills, he sees distended, compressed, strong, overladen with power. He transfigures things until they reflect his power, until they are stamped with his perfection. This compulsion to transfigure into the beautiful is art. Everything, even that which he is not, is nevertheless to such a man a means of rejoicing over himself. In art man rejoices over himself as perfection. It is possible to imagine a contrary state, a specifically anti-artistic state of the instincts, a state in which a man impoverishes, attenuates, and draws the blood from everything. And, truth to tell, history is full of such anti-artists, of such creatures of low vitality who have no choice but to appropriate everything they see and to suck its blood and make it thinner. This is the case with the genuine Christian, Pascal, for instance. There is no such thing as a Christian who is also an artist. Let no one be so childish as to suggest Raphael or any homeopathic Christian of the nineteenth century as an objection to this statement. Raphael said, Yea. Raphael did, Yea. Consequently, Raphael was no Christian. 10. What is the meaning of the antithetical concepts Apollonian and Dionysian? which I have introduced into the vocabulary of aesthetic, as representing two distinct modes of ecstasy. Apollonian ecstasy acts above all as a force stimulating the eye, so that it acquires the power of vision. The painter, the sculptor, the epic poet, are essentially visionaries. In the Dionysian state, on the other hand, the whole system of passions is stimulated and intensified, so that it discharges itself by all the means of expression at once, and vents all its power of representation, of imitation, of transfiguration, of transformation, 
together, with every kind of mimicry and histrionic display at the same time. The essential feature remains the facility in transforming, the inability to refrain from reaction, a similar state to that of certain hysterical patients, who at the slightest hint assume any role. It is impossible for the Dionysian artist not to understand any suggestion. No outward sign of emotion escapes him. He possesses the instinct of comprehension and of divination in the highest degree, just as he is capable of the most perfect art of communication. He enters into every skin, into every passion. He is continually changing himself. Music, as we understand it today, is likewise a general excitation and discharge of the emotions. But, notwithstanding this, it is only the remnant of a much richer world of emotional expression, a mere residuum of Dionysian histrionism. For music to be made possible as a special art, quite a number of senses, and particularly the muscular sense, had to be paralyzed, at least relatively, for all rhythm still appeals to our muscles to a certain extent. And thus, man no longer imitates and represents physically everything he feels, as soon as he feels it. Nevertheless, that is the normal Dionysian state, and, in any case, its primitive state. Music is the slowly attained specialization of this state at the cost of kindred capacities. 11. The actor, the mime, the dancer, the musician, and the lyricist are in their instincts fundamentally related but they have gradually specialized in their particular branch, and become separated, even to the point of contradiction. The lyricist remained united with the musician for the longest period of time, and the actor with the dancer. The architect manifests neither a Dionysian nor an Apollonian state. In his case, it is the great act of will, the will that moveth mountains, the ecstasy of the great will, which inspires to art. The most powerful men have always inspired architects. The architect has always been under the suggestion of power. In the architectural structure, man's pride, man's triumph over gravitation, man's will to power, assume a visible form. Architecture is a sort of oratory of power, by means of forms. Now it is persuasive, even flattering, and at other times merely commanding. The highest sensation of power and security finds expression in grandeur of style. That power which no longer requires to be proved, which scorns to please, which responds only with difficulty, which feels no witnesses around it, which is oblivious of the fact that it is being opposed, which relies on itself fatalistically, and is a law among laws. Such power expresses itself quite naturally in grandeur of style. 12. I have been reading the life of Thomas Carlyle, that unconscious and involuntary farce, that heroical moral interpretation of dyspeptic moods, Carlyle, a man of strong words and attitudes, a rhetorician by necessity, who seems ever to be tormented by the desire of finding some kind of strong faith, and by his inability to do so, in this respect a typical romanticist. To yearn for a strong faith is not the proof of a strong faith, but rather the reverse. If a man have a strong faith, he can indulge in the luxury of skepticism. He is strong enough, firm enough, well-knit enough for such a luxury. 
Carlyle stupefies something in himself by means of the fortissimo of his reverence for men of a strong faith, and his rage over those who are less foolish. He is in sore need of noise. An attitude of constant and passionate dishonesty towards himself. This is his proprium. By virtue of this he is and remains interesting. Of course, in England he is admired precisely on account of his honesty. Well, that is English, and in view of the fact that the English are the nation of consummate cant, it is not only comprehensible but also very natural. At bottom, Carlyle is an English atheist who makes it a point of honor not to be one. 13. Emerson. He is much more enlightened, much broader, more versatile, and more subtle than Carlyle. But above all, he is happier. He is one who instinctively lives on ambrosia, and who leaves the indigestible parts of things on his plate. Compared with Carlyle, he is a man of taste. Carlyle, who was very fond of him, nevertheless declared that he does not give us enough to chew. This is perfectly true, but it is not unfavorable to Emerson. Emerson possesses that kindly intellectual cheerfulness which deprecates over much seriousness. He has absolutely no idea of how old he is already, and how young he will yet be. He could have said of himself, in Lope de Vega's words, Yo me sucedo a mi mismo. His mind is always finding reasons for being contented and even thankful, and at times he gets preciously near to that serene superiority of the worthy bourgeois, who, returning from an amorous rendezvous, tan quam rebene gesta, said gratefully, Ut disint vires, tamen est laudanda voluptas. 14. Anti-Darwin As to the famous struggle for existence, it seems to me, for the present, to be more of an assumption than a fact. It does occur, but as an exception. The general condition of life is not one of want or famine, but rather of riches, of lavish luxuriance, and even of absurd prodigality. Where there is a struggle, it is a struggle for power. We should not confound Malthus with nature. Supposing, however, that this struggle exists, and it does indeed occur, its result is unfortunately the very reverse of that which the Darwinian school seems to desire, and of that which, in agreement with them, we might also desire. That is to say, it is always to the disadvantage of the strong, the privileged, and the happy exceptions. Species do not evolve towards perfection. The weak always prevail over the strong, simply because they are the majority, and because they are also the more crafty. Darwin forgot the intellect. That is English. The weak have more intellect. In order to acquire intellect, one must be in need of it. One loses it when one no longer needs it. He who possesses strength flings intellect to the deuce. Let it go hence, translator's footnote, an allusion to a verse in Luther's hymn, Lass fahren dahin, das Reich muss uns doch blieben, which Nietzsche applies to the German Empire. End footnote. Say the Germans of the present day, the Empire will remain. As you perceive, intellect to me means caution, patience, craft, dissimulation, 
great self-control, and everything related to mimicry. What is praised nowadays as virtue is very closely related to the latter. 15. Casuistry of a Psychologist This man knows mankind. To what purpose does he study his fellows? He wants to derive some small or even great advantages from them. He is a politician. That man yonder is also well versed in human nature, and ye tell me that he wishes to draw no personal profit from his knowledge, that he is a thoroughly disinterested person? Examine him a little more closely. Maybe he wishes to derive a more wicked advantage from his possession, namely, to feel superior to men, to be able to look down upon them, no longer to feel one of them. This disinterested person is a despiser of mankind, and the former is of a more humane type, whatever appearances may seem to say to the contrary. At least he considers himself the equal of those around him, at least he classifies himself with them. 16. The psychological tact of Germans seems to me to have been set in doubt by a whole series of cases which my modesty forbids me to enumerate. In one case, at least, I shall not let the occasion slip for substantiating my contention. I bear the Germans a grudge for having made a mistake about Kant and his backstairs philosophy, as I call it. Such a man was not the type of intellectual uprightness. Another thing I hate to hear is a certain infamous and. The Germans say Goethe and Schiller. I even fear that they say Schiller and Goethe. Has nobody found Schiller out yet? But there are other ands which are even more egregious. With my own ears I have heard, only among university professors, it is true, men speak of Schopenhauer and Hartmann. Translator's footnote. A disciple of Schopenhauer who blunted the sharpness of his master's pessimism, and who watered it down for modern requirements. End translator's note. 17. The most intellectual men, provided they are also the most courageous, experience the most excruciating tragedies. But on that very account they honor life, because it confronts them with its most formidable antagonism. 18. Concerning the conscience of the intellect, nothing seems to me more uncommon today than genuine hypocrisy. I strongly suspect that this growth is unable to flourish in the mild climate of our culture. Hypocrisy belongs to an age of strong faith, one in which one does not lose one's own faith in spite of the fact that one has to make an outward show of holding another faith. Nowadays, a man gives it up, or, what is still more common, he acquires a second faith. In any case, however, he remains honest. Without a doubt, it is possible to have a much larger number of convictions at present than it was formerly. Possible, that is to say, allowable, that is to say, harmless. From this, there arises an attitude of toleration towards oneself. Toleration towards oneself allows of a greater number of convictions. The latter live comfortably side by side, and they take jolly good care, as all the world does today, not to compromise themselves. How does a man compromise himself today? When he is consistent, when he pursues a straight course, when he has anything less than five faces, when he is genuine. I very greatly fear that modern man is much too fond of comfort for certain vices. 
and the consequence is that the latter are dying out. Everything evil, which is the outcome of strength and will, and maybe there is nothing evil without the strength of will, degenerates in our muggy atmosphere into virtue. The few hypocrites I have known only imitated hypocrisy. Like almost every tenth man today, they were actors.